All right. Are you guys all ready to play a game? So I am going to read you a list of statements, and I want you to guess what I am describing. Are you ready? Here we go. Collects detailed personal and family history information. Develops a differential diagnosis. Provides informed consent for genetic testing. Discloses genetic test results and reviews a standard plan for medical management. Does everybody have a guess? If you are thinking about a genetic counselor, I'm sorry to inform you that you are incorrect. All of the statements that I read are describing a chatbot. It's no secret that healthcare is shifting towards doing more with less. The demands are to see more patients in less time for less money with fewer human interaction. Artificial intelligence is gaining traction as a way to meet those demands, and data shows that AI is superior to humans in consistency, comprehensiveness, and speed. Whether we like it or not, technology is here to stay. And unlike my colleagues, who did a lot better than I do, um, I will neither confirm nor deny whether I'm leveraging technology today to remind me of my, uh, <laughs> my speech. But I digress. So if we think of AI as our competition in a game of survival, how should we play that game? Should we try to one-up it in areas where we have no chance of matching up? Probably not. Should we find things that it can't do well and capitalize on those? Bingo. That's the secret to success. So what does AI lack? AI lacks heart. It cannot hear the fear in a patient's voice. It cannot see the concern in a patient's eyes. And it cannot sense the tension in a patient's body. But genetic counselors can. And when we do, we are uniquely positioned to support and guide that patient in a way that no one else and nothing else can. Manu Shafiq was recently quoted as saying, in the past, jobs were about muscles. Now they're about brains, but in the future, they will be about the heart. Thankfully, as genetic counselors, we've been using our hearts for years. We have seen the future, we are ahead of the times, and we are poised and ready to own that future as long as we play our cards right. Our profession has deep roots in counseling, thanks to thought leaders like Carl Rogers and Seymour Kessler. However, over time, we've migrated away from a counseling model and moved towards a teaching model. We are prioritizing information giving over the exploration of psychological concerns and family dynamics. In other words, we are the ones doing the talking most of the time in our sessions as we provide patients with information about diseases, inheritance patterns, and genetic testing. But data shows that the less we talk, the more patients benefit. The counseling model is associated with higher patient satisfaction not to mention better emotional and knowledge-based outcomes. So why do we do this? Why do we, right? why do we gravitate toward the teaching model? Maybe it's because it's more comfortable to follow a script in a session. Maybe it's because we feel pressure to be efficient. We worry about asking questions that will open up a lengthy or intense conversation. Maybe it's because we've mistaken non-directiveness as something that limits us to being nothing more than an information provider. Maybe it's because we have imposter syndrome and we feel like true counseling is outside our scope and requires a referral to someone else. Let's put this to rest today. Genetic counselors are well-positioned, well-educated, and well-equipped to provide counseling to patients in the context of diseases that may or may not run in their family. We have the ability to go beyond the medical perspective of a risk assessment or a diagnosis. I ask each of you, are you doing this in your everyday practice? Are you talking less than your patients? 
Are you exploring what is holding them back from adhering to recommended treatments, screening, or lifestyle changes? Are you proactively delving into family dynamics that may impact the ability for that patient to share their genetic test results with their relatives? Are you forging longitudinal relationships with your patients? Are you titrating clinical details over time in order to avoid information overload? If you aren't doing these things, I would argue that you are not practicing at the top of your scope, you are not capitalizing on what makes us unique, and you are not fulfilling your obligation to support our future. I am a genetic counselor, and I am so very proud to have the word counselor in my job title. Counseling is an innate part of my profession, so ingrained in it that the term is actually in the words I use to describe myself on my business card. Counseling is something that AI cannot do, so let's leverage that skill to its maximum capacity. Just as our heart keeps us alive as human beings, it may also be what allows us to survive and flourish as a profession in the future. But counseling takes time, and like other healthcare providers, we are feeling pressure to do more with, more with less. We need to be efficient. So how do we do this? while at the same time leveraging the counseling model, letting our patients do most of the talking, if only there was someone, something, that could do some of the more routine things that we do in order to free up our time in the session so that we can do more meaningful work with patients. I'm sure you see what I'm getting at. Let's leverage AI. Let's allow it to help. But let's remain in the driver's seat and make it work for us versus the other way around. If we fight AI, we run the risk of losing our position of power. Instead, let's embrace it and be the ones to determine its scope and set its boundaries. And another thing, I will bet you money that if we drive the appropriate use of AI and spend less time on rote tasks, we will derive greater professional satisfaction from our patient encounters. We will be challenged to a higher degree, we will have more varied experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, and we may actually see less genetic counselors leaving patient-facing roles because the monotony will give way to deeper connections and greater emotional fulfillment. How will NSGC help us move into this new world? As our professional home, it will support us in practicing at the top of our scope. It will provide us with the encouragement, confidence, education, and tools to do something that scares us, let go of the teaching model that many of us are used to, and embrace that counseling model that's going to ultimately elevate us, secure our unique position in healthcare, and bring us greater professional satisfaction. As we delve into these more complex interactions with patients, we may see the cognitive burden of our day-to-day -day work decrease, but the emotional burden may increase. And NSGC, as always, will foster a connected community that we can turn to for support and strength. So we have the tools, we have the expertise, we have the training, we have the support. So let's stop hiding behind things that can be done by others. Can a chat bot do it? Let it do it. Can a video do it? Let it do it. Can another healthcare provider do it? Then welcome them with open arms, guide them, support them. Do something valuable with the time you saved. Do something no one else can do but you. As genetic counselors, we are not just health educators. We are not just providers of informed consent. And if I can get on my soapbox, which I've probably already been on for quite a while, we are not gatekeepers of genetic testing based on criteria decided by expert panels or insurance companies. We are genetic counselors, and above all else, we use our hearts. Happy 40th NSGC.